My name is Nathan Arison, and I'm about to share with you the terrifying experience that to this day has me avoiding at all costs the all too famous Central Park. It all started when I first moved to Manhattan. I didn't have many friends at the time as I had just graduated from college and moved here for work. But eventually, I met a friend named Paul. As time went by, I began meeting Paul's other friends and eventually I became a part of their friend group. We spent most of our time together at Paul's apartment as it was the nicest and it was relatively close to Central Park and all the best spots. Now, like most people, I visited Central Park once in a while, usually to clear my head or think. But I only ever went there in the evenings as I preferred it with fewer people. Sometimes I'd stay too long and I'd have to sleep at Paul's. He never seemed to mind though, as he was usually out late with our friends at clubs or on a date. But this didn't last long, as the encounter I had the next week made sure I never got close to his apartment ever again. The date was the 6th of June, 2019. I was in a pretty bad place as the company I worked for at the time had been taken over by a larger corporation and decided to let some of the workers go. Now, I wasn't fired, but I had been sitting at Central Park worried, and I guess my friends somehow found out as they were all headed my way. Hey, man, Paul said before sitting next to me. I replied, Hey, guys, I thought you were all headed out. Grace then responded with, Yes, but we heard what happened. You should come with us. I simply shook my head as getting drunk and clubbing wasn't my usual scene and was certainly not how I liked dealing with my problems. My friends weren't taking no for an answer though, and Paul said, Come on, man, you never come out with us. I'm sure you'll be fine. I mean, you're great at your job. I realized there was no point saying no. I had only one option, and that was to go. So against my better judgment, I got up and followed them to the club. Immediately when I stepped into the club, I realized I had made a terrible mistake, and after just 30 minutes, I decided to leave, but Paula didn't let me. He convinced me to have a couple more drinks and talk, but after a couple of hours, I got up and called it quits. I guess I drank a little too much as it took a while for me to get my balance. But just as I was about to leave, Paul said, Hey man, you headed home? I barely heard him, but responded, Yes, I am. He continued with, You look wasted, man. I think you should stay at my place. Here are the keys. I'll get in with the spare. I decided he was probably right as the walk to his apartment was much closer, so I took the keys and began walking home. Now at this time, it was around 1 a.m., and it was also a weekday, so many people were out on the streets. Eventually, I began walking past Central Park, but just as I was headed towards Paul's apartment building, I spotted what looked like a child standing in the park. Naturally, I felt like I was seeing things due to how much I had to drink earlier that night. But I decided to look again, and sure enough, there was a little boy standing in the park. Now this was worrying as a lot of things could go wrong for a child alone in the park. I looked around to see if I could see any adults, but as far as I could tell, there weren't any. So I decided to go in and help the child. Right before I walked in, I felt a hand on my shoulder. Startled, I turned around quickly to see Paul laughing. Relax, man, it's just me. He continued with, Anyways, why are you going in there, man? I replied, Look, there's a kid there. I'm going to try to get him to his parents. Oh, that's pretty weird. Maybe I should come with you, just to make sure you're safe, Paul said laughing. We began walking towards the kid, but before we could reach him, he walked away. Paul and I followed the child and eventually got to a small gathering of people. At this point, I was almost positive I was seeing things because nothing about this group of people seemed normal. For starters, I couldn't think of a single reason why around 15 people were all gathered at Central Park at 1 a.m. in the morning. As we got closer to the group, I noticed they all seemed to be listening to one person. He seemed to be in his late 50s and was dressed in clothes I'd never seen before. He stood around six feet tall and wore a long coat and a top hat. Soon enough, I began to notice how everyone in the group seemed to be dressed like they all came from different times. The women all wore their hair differently, and some of the men wore top hats and held canes while others wore suits and ties. Nothing about this abstract group of people sat well with me, and I decided it was better we left, so I said, Paul, I think we should go. We can see the kids not here alone, so let's go home. The problem was, Paul didn't seem to be getting the same eerie feeling I was, as he simply replied, Oh, come on, man. 
don't you want to stick around and find out what's going on? I wasn't surprised by his response as Paul was generally always adventurous and didn't know when to quit. So I said, you can stay if you want, but something's off and I don't think we should be here. I turned to leave when I heard someone say to me, pardon, leaving so soon? The men who had been speaking to the group were standing there and I immediately felt chills down my spine. He reached out his hand to shake mine and to this day, I still can't describe how unbelievably cold this mystery man's hands were. His eyes were blue, but what stood out about them was I could barely see his pupils. It was like they were barely there. My friend, won't you be joining us? He said calmly. Before I could respond, Paul spoke. Well, my friend here was just going home, but I'm actually quite interested in what's going on. The man looked at me with a slight smirk on his face. Well. It's too bad your friend's leaving. This here is a tour. Well, he laughed and continued. It's quite a unique tour. I was confused as I knew a tour of Central Park happening at 1 a.m. didn't make sense in any way, so I said, Don't want to be rude, but why is the tour happening now and not at normal hours? There was a quick sign of annoyance on his face, but he quickly replaced it with a smile and walked closer to me. That's a good question, sir. But let me ask you one better. You don't truly believe that all that's happened in this place can be told in one tour. This park is over a century old and it has seen and heard things that even the oldest history books are afraid to say. He paused and looked deeply into my eyes. Some even believe it holds the souls of people too weak to leave as well as their secrets. It was only at this point I realized the rest of the tour was standing in silence, looking my way. I immediately felt I needed to leave, but for some odd reason, some part of me wanted to stay. Let's go home, Paul, I said, turning around to leave, but Paul didn't move. I figured it wasn't up for debate, and he was staying, so I began to walk away. With every step I took, I had this strong urge to return, but I decided against it, and just before leaving the park, I heard the man say, Goodbye. Bye, Nathan. In the months that followed, a missing persons report was filed. A search party was put together and posters of Paul Harper were put all over Manhattan and the surrounding cities. But there has been no news on him. After that night, I assumed Paul had stayed somewhere else that night. But after a while, I contacted the authorities and no matter how many times I've given my statement, they continued to believe I was on some sort of drug that night. In my free time, I carried out research on people going missing in Central Park. But there was no case similar to Paul's. I played over the conversations with the strange man over and over in my head, and it led me to research the history of the infamous Central Park. The oddest thing to happen during the research was I could have sworn I saw the man at the park in a photo dated 1878, wearing the same clothes and awarded for his donations towards the park. I didn't act on this as I knew no one would believe me. As the years have gone by, I've contemplated many times going back to the park to see if I'd ever meet Paul again. But sadly, I'm too much of a coward to ever return to Central Park. If you have ever met a toddler, there's a chance that child might have told you about his or her imaginary friends. As a mother of two little kids, I have a shocking story I'd like to share with you. So, I have a three-year-old daughter and a 10-month-old son. I work from home and also look after my kids. Every evening at around five, I take my kids to the Central Park and play with them. It's a great activity as my kids love to play and enjoy themselves. My daughter Nina is so cute. She loved everyone in her play school and was extremely friendly and curious. It's a task for me to keep her mind occupied all the time as she is a hyperactive kid. So when we go play at Central Park, I make her play with the other kids, ride her bike, run around, and play all sorts of other games. At times it's tough to manage two kids, but I truly enjoy it. 
Once in a while, Nina would pick up a new hobby, or should I say, obsession. Sometimes it's drawing or a craft, sometimes it's singing, sometimes it's getting dressed like me, or getting a piggyback ride from her father. Recently, I have heard her talk to someone when she is in her room alone. At first, I thought she had taken my cell phone and called her grandma. But when I entered the room, I found no phone, and Nina was sitting on her bed as though someone were standing in front of her. Hey, baby, what are you doing? In a very casual tone, Nina turned towards me and said, I'm talking to my friend. Just to make sure she hadn't snuck my phone, I asked her, Do you have my phone with you? Nope. I guess it's downstairs on the kitchen counter. All right, so how are you talking to your friend? I asked in a very casual manner, as there was no one in the room except her and me. She looked at me funny and said, He's right here, Mom. And pointed right in front of her on the bed. Playing along with her, I said, Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't see him. Do you guys want a snack or something? I can get you something to eat. Nope, I just ate dinner. And Frigg says you make terrible food. Instead of getting offended, what she said brought a memory back from a long, long time in my life. I decided that maybe it was one of her new obsessions, and it would fade with time, just like her other obsessions. However, as time passed, I found her talking to this imaginary friend more and more, especially whenever we would go to Central Park. Instead of playing with the other kids or her baby brother, she started playing with her imaginary friend. I even told her father about this, but he told me that it was just a phase and it would pass, but... I did not tell him the name of this imaginary friend. Months passed and every day she was learning something new from this imaginary friend. This phase had lasted a bit too long. One night, as I was about to tuck her into her bed, I heard her talking to her imaginary friend again. As I entered the room, Nina said, Mom, did you cry every time you used to fall off your bike? How did you know that? To this, my daughter giggled all alone and said, <laughs> I just know it. Looks like you weren't as brave as I am. <laughs> yes, my dear. You are very brave, but it's now your bedtime. I tucked her into bed. Good night. Good night to you too, baby. She giggled again. <laughs> no, Mom! That good night was not for you. It was for him. She pointed in the direction of an empty corner in her room and then looked at me with a smile and said, Good night to you too, Mom. I just walked out of the room dumbfounded. I spoke to my husband again that night and asked him if we need to consult a child psychologist or not. But he assured me that our daughter was fine and would be done with this imaginary friend soon enough. I did not tell him the name of this imaginary friend yet again. The next day when we went to Central Park, I realized the gravity of the situation. As all the kids played in the sandbox or with balls and other playing equipment, my daughter was busy playing with her imaginary friend behind a bush. This time, however, she had something that had me very, very worried. She had two pairs of paper towel rolls connected by fine wires. She was playing with them. What is this, Nina? What, what are you doing? Don't you want to play with the other kids in the sandbox or with the ball? You can also play with your baby brother if you want to. No, Mom. 
Frank here is teaching me how to defend myself against bad people. Baby, but what is this in your hand? I had a fair idea of what it might be, but I still wanted to confirm. These are nunchucks. I'm learning how to use them. When she confirmed my suspicion, I knew this imaginary friend wasn't something normal. It was deeper than I had previously thought. I also noticed that this imaginary friend was always hyperactive while at Central Park, and he always tried to separate my daughter from the other kids. Nina, we have to leave now. No, Mom! I want to play with Frank! He was just starting to teach me how to use nunchucks. I just grabbed my daughter by the hand, picked up my son, and sat on a bench in the park away from the prying eyes of the other parents. Nina was crying and was very upset that I had disturbed her playtime. I made her sit in front of me and tell me everything about this imaginary friend of hers. When she started telling me everything this friend had taught her and told her, I was sure who this imaginary friend was. She even described him to me. Baby, listen to me. You need to forget this imaginary friend and make some real ones. Or you can play with your brother if you want to, but no more playing or talking with this imaginary friend. I knew my daughter wouldn't listen to me. Okay, Mom. Um, should I tell him that I no longer will be his friend now? He's standing right behind you. This terrified me, but I knew I had to be strong for my child. Uh, sure, baby. She told that friend of hers, and from that day on, there was no imaginary friend called Frank in my little girl's life. She went back to picking up new hobbies and befriending other kids. Now, I must tell you a little bit about this imaginary friend. I knew a boy who was exactly like my daughter's imaginary friend. Just the difference was he wasn't imaginary. He played with nunchucks at the age of 12 and was pretty good in martial arts at a ripe young age. Unfortunately, he died at 14 in a park while playing on some playground equipment. The kid was none other than my elder brother, Frank. Maybe that's why he was always with Nina in Central Park. When I was about eight years old, he taught me to make nunchucks out of paper towels and wires, just as he did with Nina. Looks like the spirit of my dead brother is still looking over my daughter. Back when I was a kid, not more than 16, my friends and I used to play in a big park. We lived in a small town and right in the middle of it was a huge park. So the founding members of our town back in the day must have thought it would be a good idea to name this park after the Central Park of New York. Call it a tribute or a lack of creativity, but we too had a Central Park in our town. Now I must say, in a small town, having a big park means almost everyone wants to spend time at it. However, every evening the school soccer team practiced in the Central Park, and except for our coach and the team members, no one else used to be in the park. Mostly because we made a lot of noise while we were playing, and secondly, because it used to get dark in the park. A few of my teammates, including me, had cars, and the rest of my teammates mostly asked us to drop them off after practice. Kevin, Martin, Mitch, and I always used my car, as it was small and compact, perfect for the four of us. Most of the team left right after practice. However, me and my buddies liked to hang out in the park for a little while after. Now, you must know that our town was never experienced in any kind of paranormal experience or haunting. Neither was there any crime in our town. It was a small, safe community where everyone knew everyone and people loved to help each other. So our parents didn't mind us hanging out in the Central Park late at night. One of my friends, Mitch, lived with his grandfather, Mr. Robinson. He was a friendly old man who loved to drive around the town at night in his Mini Cooper. 
many times we would cross him in his car while going back home from the Central Park. And every time we would say, Good night, Mr. Robinson, to him in a sing-song voice. He loved us boys and treated us all like he treated his own grandson. One evening after a big match, the four of us decided that it would be a very good idea to grab a bite in the diner and return to the park to just play football for a little while before heading home. All our parents had attended the match along with Mr. Robinson, so they knew about our plan. When we were back at the Central Park playing football after dinner, Martin, who was a horror enthusiast, started sharing some horror stories he had seen on a YouTube channel, his favorite, called SSG Animation. Now, normally, none of us ever got scared of such stories, but that day in Central Park, under a few streetlights, I was scared. I didn't admit it to the other boys, but I had a feeling that someone was watching me from the dark. There were thick trees and jogging tracks all around us, and we played in a small grassy area in the middle of the park. At about 11 at night, we decided to go home as it was too late and it was a school night. I got into the driver's seat and my friends in their respective seats. Now you must understand the layout of Central Park. The park was situated in the front and the parking lot was behind it, so while driving your car in and out of the park, you would be driving on a road parallel to the park. I started the car and we were all joking about how we defeated the other team, how the players of the other team had made mistakes and gave us an easy win. Almost five minutes into our drive, I spotted a Mini Cooper coming our way. Now, everyone knew who would be in the car if you spotted a Mini Cooper in our town. I slowed my car while my friends kept chatting. When the Mini Cooper was just beside us, I stopped my car. Hey, Mr. Robinson, you going into the park? Usually at this point, Mr. Robinson would crack a dad joke or tell me to drive safely. However, that day he just stared at me with wide eyes and gave me a creepy smile. It was weird. Mr. Robinson, are you okay? By now, all my friends were turned into our conversation too. Especially Mitch, Mr. Robinson's grandson, was looking at his grandpa as if something was wrong. We all sensed a creepy feeling from the ever-friendly old man. He still didn't answer me, but just kept staring. Then he got out of his car and came near my window. You kids done playing? Yes, sir. We all answered, smiling. Good game you play today. Kick the other team's ass really good. We all nodded and then chatted with him for a while. But throughout the conversation, I felt a cold vibe from Mr. Robinson, who was always so warm. Then he abruptly told me to step out of the car. I did as he said while all my friends watched questionably at Mr. Robinson. He made me turn around and pointed in the distance toward the parking lot and the park which we had just left. And what I saw made me stumble back on my ass. I fell down and started crawling backwards. I was scared shitless and I was sweating all over and couldn't utter a word. From inside the car, all my friends looked at me funny. What? What is that? Who is that? I asked Mr. Robinson as I was struggling to breathe. He smiled at me bent down to my level and said, Wrong time. Wrong place, kid. And after he finished saying that, I covered my face with my arms and shielded myself from the impact. When I closed my eyes, I didn't see anyone. Mr. Robinson was still looking at me with that smudged look and that creepy smile. However, Mitch and Kevin were beside me picking me up, while Martin looked worried in the passenger seat. What happened, Tom? Mitch asked me. I could not describe to him what I just saw, so instead, I pointed in the direction of the parking lot. However, when I looked there again, no one was there. The parking lot was dark and isolated, as it was before. You boys take your friend home, Mr. Robinson said to Mitch and Kevin. Mitch drove the car to his house while I cooled myself in the back seat. Hey, what did you see? Mitch asked when we were a few blocks away from his house. I saw a woman, dressed in black, with long flowy hair running at lightning speed towards me. I knew she was going to harm me. Also, I felt that your grandpa was being weird. I don't believe you. You say you saw a ghost woman, but 
I do think my grandpa was acting crazy, Mitch replied, and although I was a bit shaken up, I laughed. We reached his house and the first thing we saw was the Mini Cooper parked in the open garage. We all exchanged a look and before we could get out of the car, the main door opened and there stood Mr. Robinson. Hey boys, great game. You kids want to have some soda and a sandwich? I'm making some for myself. We all just looked at the old man, dumbfounded, as there was no way he could get here before us, change his clothes, and mind you, there was only one way from the Central Park to Mitch's home, and on the way, we didn't cross Mr. Robinson, and we definitely would have because we left the park before him. Before any one of us could say anything, Mitch was out of the car. Grandpa, what were you doing at the Central Park just a few minutes ago, and how did you get here so fast? Mr. Robinson looked at us as if we were nuts. I was watching the news for the past two hours, and I left the Central Park along with all the other parents after the game. I wasn't at the Central Park a few minutes ago. At that moment, we felt like the ground had cracked beneath our feet, as all of us had clearly seen him there. Suddenly, all of my friends believed my story of seeing the ghostly woman, because they too had seen Mr. Robinson. Or, should I say, they saw whatever it was that looked like Mr. Robinson.